Hello, everybody. I am Carla Sainz. I am PAHO's Regional Bioethics Advisor, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our uh, webinar today. PAHO's Regional Program on Bioethics is part of the Department of Evidence and Intelligence for Action in Health of the Pan American Health Organization. We will be uh, uh, presenting the tool for the accreditation of research ethics committees today, and we will not have in this occasion um, a translation, simultaneous translation to Spanish. However, we have had a similar session in Spanish before, and the link uh, for that session is available, uh, um, it will be available in the chat. So, um, while I um, uh, share my screen uh, with you, okay, there, there we go. Um, is it, I am afraid it's not working out, uh, very well. Let me just get a second, hold on a second. Okay, uh, I think I think that uh, should work fine. Is that correct? If you can just let me know that it's um yes, it works. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so uh, as I said, welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, we're gonna tell you a bit more about this tool. How is it planned? In what context it's been developed? and the use that you can have uh, uh, of it. So as you probably know, PAHO's Regional Program on Bioethics uh, has the mandate from the health authorities of the countries in the Americas to integrate ethics in all areas in health. Specifically in what respects to research ethics, the goal is to strengthen, strengthen national research ethics systems. We always at PAHO talk about research ethics system because um, of the understanding that we have achieved with our member states that a systemic approach is necessary to ensure that research is always conducted ethically. And you can read more about the justification for this uh, uh, approach in our uh, governing, governing bodies document from 2018. So since we committed to move forward in research ethics with this system approach, we worked right away on developing indicators that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, address key components of a research ethics system. So uh, we have several publications, but perhaps most importantly, the publication on the indicators for strengthening re national research ethics systems where you can see that we give great importance uh, to the uh, ethics preparedness for emergencies, with, which has an important research aspect. And uh, you can see that we have a number of, of indicators. And what we are doing today, at uh, the work that we're presenting now has to do specifically with one of these indicators. So with the goal of establishing effective mechanisms for the ethics oversight of research, we have an indicator that measures the number, the number of countries that have a national body that is tasked with the oversight of research uh, ethics committees. And that includes the mechanisms for accreditation of the committees so they can be authorized to work in a certain jurisdiction. And what in uh, the purpose of this tool is to facilitate the accreditation of research ethics committees that is done by this uh, uh, by, by by a national body by the health authorities and if you want to know more about our indicators before we dive into the uh, accreditation tool uh, I'm, I'm sharing some uh, some more in information if I go back two slides you will if you go to this a publication on indicators for, for strengthening national research ethics system, you will see that you can download a tool, a chart for a national assessment. That's the evaluation tool there. 
And we have actually conducted using this tool an assessment of, if not all the region, uh, most of it, it includes the 22 countries in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean that have more than, than 1 million inhabitants. And this, in th this that's the, that has been published, I think, I think in 2022 and, uh, or perhaps early 2023. And, um, and you can see that many, many countries in the region still have not fully achieved the indicator of having a national body that does the accreditation of the communities. And some have not, have not started the progress at all. So it is because of that, these are, these are the countries as contemplated, as captured in that, uh, in, in that tool. But in order to support the accreditation process is that we're, we have developed this tool. And you can see all the documents that I have presented uh, uh, so far in the website of PAHO's Regional Program on Bioethics. I'm gonna take one second so you can, uh, if you don't have the, um, the information, still you can uh, go to the, uh, to the website of PAHO's Regional Program on Bioethics. So as I said, uh, um, we're presenting today the tool for the accreditation of research ethics committees that has already, um, since its publication um, in the last month, in December, it has, uh, uh, um, it, it has um, uh, led to a very active resp response from the countries, from the health authorities that are seeking into implementing it. But I just, uh, and, and, and then certainly the goal of this tool is to make it easier for this, for health authorities to do the accreditation process of research ethics committees and to make sure that such accreditation process is carried out in adherence with international ethical standards. By which we mean, for example, the CIOMS guidelines and all other relevant guidelines, including PAHO's own uh, catalyzing ethical research in emergency uh, guidance. So, but but I want to highlight that while this is the main goal, it is still possible that a a committee in a jurisdiction where there's not accreditation or not robust uh, not a robust accreditation process, it's still possible for a committee to use the tool as a as a mechanism to evaluate the strength of, uh, uh, if, of the committee and to see if it's, as it were, accreditable based on the highest uh, uh, standards. So um, this is the, the link to the publication and it's now available in Spanish and English, but it will soon be available in, um, in Portuguese and French as well. The most characteristic aspect of the accreditation of research ethics committees that we're proposing is that it is a two, it, it, we're proposing two types of accreditation, or you can also describe it as a two step accreditation process. So we, we are proposing a basic accreditation process that is applicable to to review to committees reviewing all research with human participants. Any committee reviewing any type of research with human participants should have this type of credit accreditation. However, we consider an additional that we call complementary accreditation process that is for the committees that review uh, clinical trials on drugs, medical devices, or other product, products or technologies to, that seek the, the authorization from the national regulatory agents. We're dividing this accreditation in two this way because we are very aware that many committees in the region do not review clinical trials on drugs and devices. So it would be, it would not be efficient to require them to get that type of accreditation, well, they'll never encounter a, 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 a protocol uh, uh, of this nature. So uh, the majority of committees, at least in Latin America and the Caribbean, do not review clinical trials on drugs on devices. They review 
other types of, of research with human participant human participants that as such is only subject to the oversight of the ethics committee. As uh, you know, clinical trials on drugs and devices uh, are on on top of, uh, of receiving the oversight of the research ethics committees based on international ethical standards, they are uh, overseen by the national regulatory authority. And such oversight is based on the uh, GCP good clinical practice standards that require a number of things that are really not appropriate or relevant for the studies that are not clinical trials on drugs and devices. And just so you have a sense, some countries have only 10 clinical trials of drugs and devices in a year. So uh, uh, what we're trying to uh, um, to propose with this uh, uh, two two step accreditation process is to make sure that that we uh, uh, do a most efficient uh, use of resources and efforts of the committees and and the health authorities, and that we're not requiring committees to uh, uh, to get ready to do something that may never do uh, uh, in the institution in in their institution. So how have we structured this tool? As you can see, we have, um, this tool is formatted in a horizontal uh, way, in a, in a uh, landscape uh, format. And uh, in the document, after some brief introduction, uh, where we give credit to all the many people that supported us in this process, includes three columns. For the most part, they're organized as columns, but you'll see three distinct areas in the document. The first column lists the criteria for the accreditation of the Research Ethics Committee. So that in this case, the criteria is constitution and there are some sub-criteria there and including an, a, a, a subset of sub-criteria. Then in the middle column, it includes the questions that health authorities should ask to review the Research Ethics Committee's standard operating procedures for, for the criterion, in this case, is constitution. So what are the questions that need to be, as it were, answered yes by, by every committee in order to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, meet the accreditation uh, uh, criteria for constitution, which is the number one we start with? Then we have a third column that, well, in the case it's not in a column, but it's on the bottom, uh, but you will see a very distinct formatting uh, as you know, specific notes that get added that are notes that meant to uh, mean to, uh, to answer frequently asked questions. So I'm gonna show you this in, um, uh, uh, so you can see it better. You have the, the criteria for accreditation, first criteria is constitution with the specific items under constitution, uh, like independence, adequate and sustainable resources, which can be financial, human, or logistical resources. And uh, uh, and the other uh, item is standard, oper having SOP, standard operating procedures. Then we have the questions for uh, uh, for each of uh, all the questions for the criteria, the constitution criteria, and then two uh, um, two notes that are relevant to highlight. Uh, for example, high, stressing out the that ethics review does include a scientific validity check uh, the analysis of the scientific validity of the study, regardless of whether there's a prior scientific review or not. And that's uh, uh, clear, as you know, from the first guideline in SEOMS. So this, uh, I've been explaining you the, the two-step approach. And in this case, every, what, what I'm showing to you in this slide applies to all the, um, all the, um, to the basic uh, accreditation. When there's something extra that is only relevant for the, for the complementary accreditation, we're highlighting that in purple. So every time you see something highlighted in purple, like in this case for the monitoring of clinical trials, the SOPs need to say la, 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 la. Well, 
that applies exclusively to the accreditation of committees that will review clinical trials of drugs and devices. If that's not your case, if that's not your committee, you can ignore that. So um, what are the criteria, the criteria for the accreditation? Here I, I just illustrated this point with the criteria seven and eight, but I'll show you the whole list of criteria. So constitution, we talked about that uh, already. Uh, functions, what's the scope of the committee? What are the activities of the committee? Then another um, criteria is, criterion is membership. Uh, and that involves uh, information about the number of members, the characteristics of members, their responsibility, the structure of membership, the training, which for clinical trials, uh, the review of clinical trials and of drugs and devices includes training on GCP, and then mechanisms for selecting members. The fourth criterion is documentation and archiving. So, and then we list all the specific documents that that committees need to uh, uh, keep to to maintain uh, for accreditation. Then, regarding the submission of protocols, the fifth criterion we uh, have sub criteria as mechanisms for submission, documentation for review, the procedures to determine whether ethics review is necessary, and the procedure for determining the type of review. Then we have a sixth criterion on the review process that, again, has a, a well, the, the, the information that's expected regarding the types of review, the ethical basis for the analysis, the review strategies, the mechanisms for uh, uh, convening external experts, the, manage, the managing of conflict of interest, how the meetings are handled, decision-making issues, the different types of decisions, of decisions a committee can issue, the, the way to communicate the decisions and the deadlines for the process. The seventh criterion is the monitoring of ongoing research and it, and it covers the extension of approvals, adverse management of adverse events, amendments, progress reports, and the final report. And the last three uh, uh, criteria are procedures in health emergencies. As I said, we're using this, as, this exercise as an opportunity to put push our region to improve our ethics preparedness for emergencies. So these procedures require the existence of expedited procedures if the REC is required to review research in emergencies. Regarding transparency and accountability, which is a, another topic that uh, is not exclusive for emergencies, but we have learned that it becomes really prominent in emergencies. Uh, with the, the existence of a, of a website for the committee and uh, uh, and the, the the development of annual reports. And lastly, coordination and communication mechanisms that arguably are also lesson learned from uh, the, 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 the COVID, the COVID pandemic has uh, 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 perhaps made us uh, reassess what the com coordination and communication mechanisms for the review of research should be. So this is the presentation. And uh, before switching to uh, 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 discussing questions and comments you may have about this tool, I want to invite you all to be part of our ethical research network, also called Investigación Etica. And that's the link uh, so you can su subscribe to the list. And everything that is sent through the list is um, uh, is in both English and Spanish. So I'm gonna stop uh, uh, sharing uh, my slides now and I want to um, I want to invite my colleague uh, Sara Carracedo who's gonna uh, uh, help uh, uh, moderating the, um, the 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 discussion session. And as she said before, I really want um, want you to uh, uh, ask questions or share your comments using the um, using the the Q and A uh, function because there it's great. We have lots of comments in the um, in the chat, but sometimes it's hard to uh, hard to see them all. Uh, so I'm 
without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Sarah to see if we have already any question or comment. So thank you, Carla. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this seminar. I will be asking your questions, so please send them through the Q&A uh, function. Right now, I don't see too many questions through Zoom, but I have some questions from past events that are relevant uh, to today's session, so I would use them. Uh, so the first question is, uh, who should be in charge of the accreditation of research ethics committees and why? Great. Thank you for this question. So every health authority, at every country, there has to be a national body that has the task of doing the accreditation of research ethics committee. The, there's not a single formula for the governance, for research ethics governance. So that can, in some countries, uh, for example, in Brazil, couldn't, uh, um, or in, in Panama, there's a, a national a committee that has that the, the duties of accreditation. In some countries, it is an office within the health authority, for example, in, in Chile, in Peru, in Peru is within the Ministry of Health, but it should be a clear an, an entity that is that that, that has this uh, uh specific uh, uh task. And uh and what's the point? I mean the Research ethics should, there should be some governance, there should be some order. That someone has to ensure that those committees that have the important job of ensuring that every single research protocol is ethical can do a good job, are accredited to do a good job. And, um, and that also involves uh, the health authority that does the accreditation also should support the committees doing their work. And, um, and that uh, uh, the, the the research the, this national body should be as it were a go to person. So if if the committee or or go to entity, if a committee receives a proposal that say the committee feels like, hey, I, I don't know how to handle this. So who who should I who who's in charge of overseeing me that can uh, uh, help me? And very often those national bodies. Uh, uh, do have uh, uh, also the duties to support the training of committees and sometimes also of investigators. So um, ideally, there's a, a constructive and uh, uh, an and agile uh, relationship between the committees and the entity, the national uh, uh, entity, the national health authority entity that is cha in charge of uh, of um, of accrediting. One more comment uh, uh, in addition is that it is possible to say, as I was saying, the governance of research, I mean, there's it doesn't come only in one flavor. You, you, I mean, we have objectives that have to be achieved, but those objectives can be achieved in different ways. So it is possible to conceive that one entity does the accreditation, the basic accreditation of the committees and that a second entity that is focused on the oversight of clinical trials does the complementary accreditation. Uh, and in that case, committees that are already, already have a basic accreditation could request the, the, this uh, complementary accreditation for from an entity that does the oversight of uh, clinical trials with drugs and devices. Thank you. So. Now we have many questions. Um, many of them are uh, related to the future steps of this tool. So uh, what are the next steps? What should countries do now with this tool? And uh, how, uh, yeah, and, and, and another one that is from uh, Lionel that is related is if there is going to be any kind of support for countries who want to implement this tool? Great. So it was, it, it, we were really delighted since we published uh, um, the, the accreditation tool to receive so many notes from countries saying right away that they wanted to use the tool. So, and the use depends on the different types of use of the, of the tool depends on where the different countries are. So some countries 
uh, already have a robust accreditation process that perhaps uh, uh, they've been uh, uh, has was established say five years ago or ten years ago, but uh, so this tool can be used by those countries to check if there are some elements, some newer elements from newer guidance uh, that that uh, that are in the accreditation tool that they should be adding to their existing accreditation processes, or. Some countries that already have uh, robust accreditation processes may realize based on the tool that they have to distinguish the processes for just basic accreditation and, com and uh, 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 complementary ac accreditation. And we've, had, we've heard from health authorities that are gonna be using the tool in that way. They were saying, well, we're accrediting everybody every committee, as if every committee would reviewing clinical trials on drugs and devices, but that's not the case. So we're gonna start, the, the, the way of the way in which they're using the tool is dividing their accreditation process into types based on the type of proposals that the committees review. So a, a country that does not have an accreditation process yet can use the tool to develop their own accreditation process. So they can say, they, they can start with the questions and it may be that for some of the questions, they think it's necessary to explain exactly how they're gonna interpret one of the, a term, for example, or perhaps they may, they may be, uh, they may think that this is a very robust accreditation process that includes the, the most updated understanding about research ethics. So perhaps a country will say, you know what? It might be too hard to go from zero accreditation to such a robust accreditation process. So perhaps we're gonna start a first year requiring just a, this set of questions. And then the next year will require the whole set of questions. So that's a way in which a country that does not have accreditation processes can use the tool. And uh, addressing uh, uh, Lionel Gresh's uh, uh, comment, we are supporting the countries uh, to implement the tool. And we, uh, uh, PAHO's Regional Program on Bioethics is already helping many countries uh, uh, that have questions. And we've seen that depending on the different use that countries are are, uh, are giving, um, dep depending on the different ways countries are, are using the tool, they may need or may not need uh, uh, much help from us implementing implementing the tool. But the the type of support that is uh, uh, that is most demanding on which I think we as PAHO's regional Pro program in bioethics are most uh, 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 needed as it were, is when countries have not started accreditation processes yet and they have like new teams uh, at the health authority they have to do this, uh, uh, start doing this. So they need to, uh, uh, they, they, those teams would need training to understand the processes better and uh, or, or, or newly established uh, uh, entities. And for example, we've been supporting Paraguay to uh, uh, develop a, a national policy on research ethics that was recently approved within this month. And we will be supporting Paraguay, Paraguay's new uh, uh, health authority to to use the the tool uh, to start the accreditation process of of the committees. Thank you uh, for that answer. So another question uh, is related to the accreditation of regional ethics committees. So do you think this tool can help to do that? Do we need a different kind of I don't know, document? What are your thoughts on that? Um, it it would be, I, I just want to clarify by saying it's not, PAHO, PAHO has not planned uh, a, a regional accreditation of committees, but there's really, really no reason why the, um, the tool could not be used at a regional or sub-regional level. For example, and then this is, uh, I'm just thinking uh, uh, aloud, right? For example, we have, there have been some efforts at some sub-regions 
the, like the uh, Central America and, and Dominican Republic subregion, the Comisca subregion. And there have been many discussions also within uh, uh, the, the English speaking Caribbean countries to, as it were, team up for uh, uh, research ethics efforts because you know, there are many very small countries. So there, it, it could be, it, 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 it would be possible to use the tool to for some subregional uh, accreditation in those in those cases, and while we do not have a regional committee, I think that uh, if you we may uh, in the future think that's the way to go. M if you go to our website of our publication, Catalyzing Ethical Research in Emergencies, one thing that we have been, you will see, um, you will see in the section on strategies for ethics review in emergencies, we have considered extraterritorial review as at least something that is possible, that is conceivable, that could be done. So uh, it, it would be, reasonable to expect that if we were to move forward in the future with something like that at a regional or sub-regional level, this uh, uh, this tool could be useful for such a, for the accreditation of a committee uh, uh, of those characteristics. Thank you uh, for that answer. So uh, I have a question here regarding the uh the ethics re the the charging for ethics review right so I, I know this topic is included in in a note in the in the tool but could you explain a bit more why charging for ethics review uh is not wrong or or to say it better why does not necessarily mean that there is a conflict of interest right so we want, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm glad this topic has been uh, brought to the discussion uh, because it's a topic that uh, has led to a lot of regional reflection during COVID. Uh, so we all want, we know research ethics review is not a piece of cake, right? We know it's a lot of work and it's serious work. It's hard. You need proper training and we want it to be done within a reasonable time frame. We know that, hey, getting, I mean, waiting nine months for a review doesn't help anyone. We know research, we do research because research advances the health and well-being of people. So we all should be trying our best to do every part of the process faster without sacrificing rigor. rigor. So charging for, for, um, for ethics review could uh, uh, facilitate uh, the, the, the work of the committee and and there's nothing wrong with charging for ethics review. What would be wrong would be to charge to, to, to charge for an approval. But to pay for a rigorous review process would help us uh, improve the professionalization of committees, would, would uh, um, help us ensuring that committees have the resources to do a good job. And, uh, and if you look at the tool, you'll see that there are lots of things that committees have to do that require a very uh, uh, a robust secretariat. Sometimes institutions decide that the best way to ensure that they have such robust secretariat is charging for the reviews. And that is not on its own problematic. It's not ethically problematic. It's not that the approvals are being, are being, uh, um, are, are being sold you're charging for a review. And, and if you think about it, and this is a, the terms in which we discussed this during the pandemic, if you think about it, every other party in the system is getting paid for the work that they do. Investigators get paid. People at health authorities doing their work on, uh, uh, I don't know, just uh, authorization of clinical trials or, or people that work on health authorities doing the accreditation of committees, they get a salary. Why on earth do we think that everybody but uh, uh, but the committee can get paid? And uh, as we have also concluded uh, as a result of a regional reflection that members of the committee, members of committees should be compensated. 
It may be with money. It may be with with uh, uh, getting uh, hours counted for the work. But it is also a way to show that that we value ethics. Ethics is serious, and uh, and so far we have a system where ethics is some sort of like unpaid labor, kind of like the work of women was being seen uh, uh, some years ago and unfortunately still seen in some jurisdiction. But paying for review is per se not ethically problematic. We never pay for the results of the review. And uh, and it may be valuable to ensure that the committee can do a good job. Of course, a whole different discussion about how how to uh, uh, decide on the uh, on on how much it's going to be the committee is going to be char be charging and and I think that here's just the context in which I would say well we need to use some common sense because it, it would make sense to charge a, a study that costs very little money uh, and is say conducted by a study the same amount of money that we're charging a clinical trial by a, a company right so of course uh, that uh, needs to be decided in a reasonable way thanks uh, there is a question about communication so are communication channels and relationships with other research ethics committees necessary how should these uh, communication and coordination mechanisms be? This is a uh, uh, this is a great a great topic, uh, and I think a topic on which we, uh, as a bioethics community, have been a little bit slow to react and act, and uh, and it's a topic on which we have learned a lot during COVID. Uh, so we do have. A uh, criterion on coordination and communication mechanisms. Regarding communication, we uh, want to make sure that the committee has a mechanism to communicate with the public. What if something goes wrong? How is how is the committee going to inform the public about something? And if you wait for something to go to go wrong to create a mechanism to communicate, then you will not be able to communicate. And 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 you will have to keep in mind that the trust of the public in research depends on a great uh, to a great extent on research ethics committees that have the job ens of ensuring that research is done ethically. So that's uh, regarding uh, uh, communication. On top of what is a little bit more more common, uh, uh, which is a mechanism like an uh, uh, an email or some way in which participants can contact the committee. That's also something on which we're a little bit th that we're a little bit more used to in the region. Regarding uh, uh, coordination, there, specifically, what we learned during COVID is that we work a lot better if we're capable of communicating between committees with the health authority, with the national regulatory authorities. And we need to work on having uh, uh, those channels. What we learned during COVID is that we came up with ways to coordinate between the different, between committees and with, an authority, health, and with the health authorities that were so great and so useful that made the work a lot more agile. And there's no reason to wait for an, for another emergency to implement those uh, um, those communication systems. You know from committees the things that that worry us often, like oh my god, this uh, is this being is, is this proposal being submitted by uh, um by uh, uh it has it been rejected by other committees? Is it is there what we call like ethics committee shopping? How will I know? So good system of communication in this case, probably mediated by the health authority that accredits the committee could really facilitate uh, 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 the and strengthen the whole process and as it were, alleviate many of the concerns that we sometimes have uh, within committees. Great, thanks. Uh, this is a question that I mean, it's related with the tool, but maybe you have some uh, things to say about that. And it is about local ethics review. Should local ethics review be mandatory? Uh, is it ethical to have a research ethics committee in country A that uh, approve a study uh, that will be conducted in country B? What, what, what do we have to say about that? The established 
uh, uh, standard that we go by now is that country is that studies must obtain a review in the country where the study is going to be conducted. Okay, so you have to ensure if this if there's the study is going to be conducted in Peru, well, there has to be a review from a committee from an accredited committee in uh, in Peru on top of any other review that may be required internationally. For example, on top of PAHO's Research Ethics Committee uh, 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 review. And that's the way we usually roll. I wanna, get a, I wanna get, uh, uh, I'm gonna mention two exemptions. The first except, exception, uh, sorry, it's exception, not exemption. The first exception is considered in CIOMS, I think it's guideline 20, for studies that are exclusively online. If I'm gonna do an online study uh, and I'm gonna have allow people from every country in the world to take my online survey, does it mean that I need a, a, an approval for a research ethics committee in every country? That doesn't make sense. So CIOMS does acknowledge that that's a case, that's a case uh, uh, that calls for an exception. Additionally, and I think that I saw that mentioned somewhere there in the Q&A, we uh, are aware that uh, 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 that uh, uh, in some countries in Central America, the health authority uh, uh, had uh, identified weakness in the community center. It, we're talking about countries where the, all the governance, the research ethics governance pieces are still not in place. And in the absence of an accreditation process, uh, in the country and in the absence of uh, uh, accredited committees by the health authorities, they relied on accredited committees from uh, uh, another country. This situation is not ideal, but it's uh, uh, when you're when you face a problem, you need to you you need to uh, 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 decide on a trade off, and this was uh, uh, a decision that was made to uh, ensure that uh, local, that, to ensure that a, a, um, that a good ethics review was provided. But uh, I just want to highlight the value of the local review. There's some stuff that is very, very hard to understand, to properly consider from the distance. I am responsible for PAHO's Research Ethics Committee and we review the proposals that are conducted with PAHO's involvement everywhere in the region. And it would be extremely, I mean, as and we're a group, an interdisciplinary group and uh, in with uh, uh, people from different countries, but it would be extremely arrogant from us to think that we'd know better about some something that in that uh, that is very local in nature, whether a specific, the specific amount of payment is reasonable or not, would definitely be better assessed by the local people, by, by the local committee than, uh, uh, than by a committee that is miles away from the jurisdiction where the study is being conducted. And same thing about understanding about some other very local concerns or laws. I mean, we the, the, the value of ethics review in the uh, in the jurisdiction where the study is going to be conducted, cannot really be uh, uh, understated. Thank you. So now we have a question. I, I think we have time for a couple uh, more questions. So one is uh, regarding the membership. Uh, is there a specific list of professions that must be included? in a research ethics committee. And regarding the, the lawyer, uh, is it mandatory to have a lawyer in a research ethics committee? Because some countries have this requirement. So what do we think about that? Thank you uh, for, uh, I think this is a very, a very important uh, uh, question as well. So in the, in the tool, we, this is something that we discussed extensively and and I want to say some countries may may add based on their laws based on uh, uh, their priorities may add to this accreditation tool but we're we're looking for something that is both basic 
but really ensures that the, well fun that the committee functions well. So in the tool, you will see we do not have, um, we do not require uh, a, uh, a specific, a specific uh, profile of um, of committees. So we just say that we need it needs to include a balance of different disciplines and perspectives: medicine, social sciences, ethics, research methodology, and and what we know is that different committees may have. Um, uh, uh, for example, some committees may not need a social scientist. Some committees may need someone, uh, I don't know, like more sp uh, uh, expertise in pediatrics. So committees are uh, are so different and, and that the, the research institution, I mean, each committee has to make sure that they, that they have the expertise that's needed for the type of studies they review. I used to be in a different committee that would be a very different type of study, and it would it, it wouldn't have helped for me to just come with my checklist and apply it to Pajo's research ethics committee because Pajo reviews a very different type of studies. So uh, we wanted to make sure that there's flexibility there, and we are uh, and and we had also two additional concerns. One is this um, checklist approach. Like check, check, check. Oh, we have a lawyer. We're done. We have this. We're done. We have this. We're done. And more than going with a checklist approach, what we want to call for is a is a reflection on what type of studies do we review, and based on what we review, what type of expertise do we have? We're uh, we're worried that if that if that uh, um if that reflection is not done, and people just go with a simple list. We will have committees that meet the criteria in the list, but do not uh, are not capable of doing a proper review of the studies uh, they receive. And our second concern is that um, I find it like really interesting that historically there has been a, uh, uh, especially in the region of the Americas, some such an emphasis on the inclusion of a uh, of a lawyer in the committees which is really not obvious uh why would why would an a lawyer be needed uh, uh for an ethics uh, uh deliberation if the institution thinks that a lawyer is is necessary for whatever specific characteristics they have that's fine but most importantly what you want to ensure is that people have expertise on ethics review of the research type that they receive so in in and I think that perhaps when we were when a region was young and less mature on bioethics, less knowledgeable about research ethics, we perhaps thought back then that oh ethics that sounds like law. So we just thought like oh have a lawyer and that solves the problem. But now we're so much farther ahead in this route and we've progressed so much more and and we have such a. a a, a, a way more nuanced understanding of research ethics and ethics review process. And I think now we can afford going with more granularity to this uh, uh, assessment of who is a member of the committee. Thank you. So uh, we can have one more question. And, and uh, hold on. And before you go to that question, perhaps one thing that I want, I don't want to miss the opportunity to say regarding membership is that one confusion that we very often see is that people think people think that a, that health that that uh, people uh, in in decision making positions that hierarchy say the chief medical officer or the minister of health or the director of the institution should be part of the committee and we have very very clear guidance against that from WHO that's i would say at this point 12 or 13 years old, those persons should not be part of a committee. In order to protect the, the committee and ensure the committee has a proper deliberation, a genuine ethics analysis, no one in any of those decision-making positions ha can be member of a research ethics committee. It's clearly against international ethical standards to have a, a person of such prominence be part of the committee. 
And uh, in in and I was talking earlier about ensuring diversity and representativeness, and and which is it's good, right? But you have to keep in mind that once you're part of a committee, you are not defending your, uh, you're not there um, to advance the interest of your department, of your entity. A committee is a collegiate body and you are a member to, uh, uh, once you, even if you're selected to ensure diversity from different areas of the institution, once you're a member, you're there to deliberate uh, uh, on the basis of ethical standards. You're there in your personal capacity to think and be part of this collegiate body. Thank you. So maybe we can finish uh, the seminar with a general question, which actually was also asked in the seminar in the Spanish. So uh, is that complementary accreditation better than the basic one? Should all research ethics committees aim to, to have this complementary accreditation? Thank you for that question. So the way I've been explaining this, Im imagine you get, Imagine you're you want to drive, right? If I, I have a driver's license, I I drive. I'm mostly on a bike, but I, I do I do drive occasionally. Uh, but I drive. If I drive, I drive a car, right? So my license to drive is to drive is the license to drive a normal car. Do I need? I mean, and if when I went to the to the Department of Motor Vehicles, I had to and, and applied for a license. I had to decide: Oh, do I need a license to drive a normal car, or do I need a commercial license to drive a professional vehicle like a truck? And I chose the one that suits my needs. I I don't drive a, a, a truck. I don't need a professional license, so I. I have the license that suits my needs. So the, the basic accreditation is the, the accreditation that suits the needs of many committees. And there's no need for them to get a, a, a complementary accreditation as much as there's no need for me to get the driver's license to drive a professional truck, because that's not what I do. So, but perhaps, but say Carla is thinking about changing her job. Well, if I'm thinking that perhaps I perhaps I want to be able to apply for a job driving a truck. So perhaps perhaps if even if I don't currently drive a truck, perhaps I want to be eligible to buy a truck in a future job, in which case there would be a reason for me to apply for a driver's license, for a professional driver's license to drive a truck. Is it better? It's not better. It's different. It depends on the needs on everyone. And I think we've been uh, uh, which struggled a lot with the terms, which is the two steps, uh, uh, what they were trying to convey is that it, I mean, first to accredit everybody for, uh, all, all the committees need to be accredited for, you receive the basic accreditation. But if you, what you need is a, uh, uh, is an accreditation to review clinical trials of drugs and devices. If what you need is a is a, a, a professional driver's license to drive a truck, well, at least you should have, you know, at least you should know, show that you have a, a, a license to drive a car first, right? No one goes from not knowing how to drive to driving a truck, right? And it's efficient. If you think about the, your, if you think you're the Department of Motor Vehicles, well, it's easier if you want to give professional license to to test to have the test to people that already have a non-commercial driver's uh, driver's license so that's that that's how this is uh, uh uh conceived we don't want if those and we want to make sure that if those are done if each accreditation process is done by two di different institutions one want to make sure it's it, it, want to make sure is that there's some efficiency that the second institution doesn't start from scratch because that's another inefficiency, you know. So that that uh, if the 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 um if the supplementary the complementary accreditation is going to uh, uh done, be done by a different institution, they don't need to check on the basic accreditation uh, uh 
uh, on their own. That that's already done by another entity. And let's just make the best use of our of our uh, uh, resources, uh, uh, promoting ethical research, and and instead of like repeating what's been done by other entity already. And so one thing that I think is key for research is trust. Let's trust. The national regular say the national regulatory authorities or, or or some entity related to it is going to be in charge of the complementary accreditation. Well, they should trust the national health authority that already did the basic accreditation. That's how we team up. That's how we move faster. That's how we avoid uh, uh wasting uh resources and making the most of of what we have to advance and promote good ethical research, which is research that improves the health and well-being of our people. So um, I think that is uh, the final, uh, uh, we're the ending of our webinar. We, um, we really invite you to, um, to go to, to join our ethical research network we will be sharing uh it'll take us a little bit but we'll we will share the the video of this uh of this uh webinar in english and uh you're welcome to um to go to our website too and see all the other resources that we have for example the catalyzing ethical research in emergencies that i think is still now the the only uh uh, research ethics guidance of this point of this type that uh, uh, builds on the experience and the lessons learned uh, uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Soon we will have the publication in Portuguese too and soon after that in French and uh, and we're, we're very thankful for your participation and please uh, 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 read those of you at health authorities that need support that are not already being supported by PAHO's regional program on bioethics, please uh, 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 reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.